Hello guys, uh, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I was very lucky to get a really interesting person to agree to sit down with me today. And I want to thank my friend Alex Kosh. He's got a YouTube channel, Alex Kosh and uh, K-O-S-H. And Alex introduced me to Steve. And this gentleman has built the most amazing house I've seen since I've been in the Philippines. He's had a fascinating life, super nice guy, very interesting. He was kind enough to sit down with me and chat for over 30 minutes. And I hope you enjoy the interview. But at the end of the interview, please go to the link in the description below and watch Alex's video on this house. This, this property is absolutely amazing, stunning. The detail, the artwork that's inside, you'll really enjoy it. It's a $4 million house, so you're going to have to watch that. So anyway, uh, thanks again for Alex for introducing me to Steve. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. If you share my videos with your friends, I really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Hello, buddy. Uh, welcome back to the show. I've got my new friend, Steve. And Steve has been so kind to uh, let me come into his beautiful, magnificent home and tell me a little about his life. And so, um, Steve, how long have you been in the Philippines now? Actually living here? Actually living here full time, three and a half years. But you built this house like how long ago? We built the house, finished it in early 2012. 2012 and so you've got a wife you've got two daughters and when i was working the deal was they came with me right so the kids have, have lit, been to every continent except australia really so um where was the last place you were with your children south africa wow we you lived in you, south africa for two years and you liked it there huh yeah south africa is gorgeous so you're living in south africa and then this house is still here right right now, so I guess you have people looking after it. You're not concerned about just walking away from it, or? Oh, I mean, we definitely had people looking after it. You, you, yeah, you just can't leave your house behind. The yeah. yard's got to be taken care of. We didn't drain the pool because we were a bit in and out. Uh -huh. So you, you have to take care of everything. Yeah. I, I don't know of anybody in the Philippines that would leave their house empty. There's always a maid, a yard guy, somebody. Yeah, I agree. Taking care of it. Well, because you mentioned the video, um, there's, by the way, at the end of this, I have a, um, I'll be putting a link to my friend Alex's video. He did a whole video on this, on this house, and you'll see the link to it uh, in the description. But um, you mentioned in there, in the video with uh, Alex, that you would never, um, that there's always something to do. Yes. And I, I guess that's you, though, walking around, noticing things like, if you just leave the house and you're in South Africa, is there somebody you trust that's going to walk around and say, well, that door needs to be fixed, or that paint's chipping, or the pool's leaking, or whatever? Is there someone that you trust that can that notices all those things for you? For, for this, for us, yes. Okay, that's good to have. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, we've got a, t two guys that take care of the yards and two maids that are family members that take care of the house. Okay. And then a foreman that is just was on the original construction crew, and we've just stayed together. Wow. So, but yeah, somebody keeps an eye on it. As far as little things like the door sticks or doorknobs broken, not so much because there's nobody in the house. Yeah. But if you know a pipe broke on the pool or a coconut broke one of the roof tiles, something like that, mm. they would. I would expect them to fix it, and, mm. and they do. Yeah. I mean, Judith gets a note saying, "Oh, by the way, we had to replace three roof tiles because something happened." Mm. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you. Um, so where are you from originally? I'm originally from Florida. From so I'm Florida, an Americano. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what did you do? Like when you, you went to university and what did you study? And <laughs> I went to the University of Florida. I got a master's degree in education oh. and had the privilege of teaching school for three years while starving. So yeah. you go, you take all that education, master's degree, only to work three years in, their, in your profession. You find a lot of people do that. They spend all this time getting a degree, advanced degree. And then once they actually get out in the workforce, they decide to do something else. Yes. I, I think it happens with teachers a lot because I, I, don't, I can't speak for anybody else. For yeah. me, I didn't really think about what $10,000 a year in 1979 meant. Yeah, right? It's not much. It's not much. My wife was a, at the time was a secretary making more money than I was. So, yeah. And then she was pregnant and now what are you going to do? So I moved to a mining. I, I worked summers for a mining company. Well, what what age kids were you were, uh, teaching? What grades? Middle school, which was sixth Ooh. grade, seventh grade. Aren't those like the worst? 
I actually, <laughs> my, my, they're my only point of reference. I liked them. Hmm. No, I didn't, I taught history and social studies. So for me, it was great. I used to own a roller skating rink in St. George, Utah, and um, had kids from kindergarten all the way up to university with me. And every kid knew me within 100 miles. But the ones I had the hardest time controlling were middle school girls. Okay. The boys, I could, could, I could look at them and say, look, you better stop doing that. I'm going to make you go home. The girls... They just cross their arms to well, I just do whatever I want. Yeah. And I could not, I couldn't get them to, to do what I wanted them to do. They were just always out of control. But, you know, middle school girls, they were the hardest. And I have two daughters too, so I remember that age, you know. They'd go in the room, slam the door, and you didn't have any idea what you did. <laughs> I've got six daughters, four from the six? first marriage. Yeah, no sons. Wow. And twin 10 year olds here. And as dad, girls are wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, they are. I mean, yeah. I mean, moms may have a problem now and again, but dads. Yeah, my daughters, they never their whole life ever did anything to make me mad. I just, it was impossible. You know, spill the milk down the wall. That's okay. We'll go clean it up, you know. <laughs> so, anyway. So, you, um, you gave up teaching and then you went into mining. Went into mining. That's a huge shift. Yeah. But you said your father did that. That's the reason my you let My dad it. did it. And the reason I, he, he was an industrial engineer that went into mining and I swore I wouldn't and he you know, back in the day single income families right yeah. mom stayed home raised the kids so he when I woke up in the morning in the dark he was gone when it came time for dinner most nights he'd be home sometimes not because the hours he put in was this in Florida in Florida huh so yeah I swore I wasn't going to do that went into education a great idea hmm. uh, then but fortunately, one of the benefits of the company he worked for was if, they, if an employee had a kid in college, they would give them preferential hiring during summer break. Oh. Because all the, in that day, all the employees wanted to take summer vacation because their kids were off. Yeah. So all, everybody wanted to be off at the same time. They'd bring in all the college kids like me hmm. to, be, to fill in the, the most junior crappy jobs. But it was great. So it's like getting a job in the mailroom at a big company and starting at the bottom and yeah, it's so, you got your foot in the door. Yeah, I had four summers of you know pushing a wheelbarrow, digging, working in the metallurgical lab, doing samples, all this stuff. Always the, the most junior person on the now, planet. Now, what was that, the pay like compared to being a teacher, like say per hour or per day? Or um, When I went back to him, I said, I can't afford to keep teaching. Can mm -hmm. you hire? I need a job. I got two job offers in two different companies, mm -hmm. both from people I knew just because I'd work. I yeah. came to work on time and I worked. And I got a job as a metallurgical trainee, which is a kind of engineer, mm -hmm. for double what I was making teaching school. Wow. $20,000 a year. I was rich. Wow. That's, that was good money back then, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, not really, but it was to us. It was middle class money, you know? Yeah. Well, we could afford a little house, and we could mm. afford a car, and we could afford... Don't you think it's a tragedy that teachers and police officers and people like that are so underpaid in America where, you know, rock stars and all these other people making millions of dollars, and it's just... And these are they're teaching our children, so you'd think that a teacher should be the ones making <laughs> a couple hundred thousand dollars a year because they're so valuable to society. There's... Look, it's a... It, when we were growing up, single single income families were the the standard. Yeah, my mom, same thing. My mother didn't work. But I I would in my I kind of look at things different. Maybe I think there's two problems. One problem is people don't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's come back to that. The other problem is I can't understand why things cost so much. Right when back in the in, the, in 1960. Uh, a car actually costs more than a house. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, a, 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 not a big house, but yeah, a, yeah. a normal little tiny, th you know, little three-bedroom concrete mm -hmm. block house. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, we lived in one of those. How? Yeah, me too. Houses were, were much cheaper. It, and if you look at the price of a house and you look at it, I'd love somebody to, to say why. Hmm. What, what's changed that has driven the price of houses up? College education, when I went, you know, my dad struggled to pay tuition for a state school. But today, it's, it's insane. Why? What's happened that 
the price of college has risen far faster than, than inflation. Now, I went to University of Cincinnati. I didn't graduate, but it was, I'm pretty sure it was $700 a quarter. I think I mean, mine was 1100 Yeah. You know, why? And now it's like, you know, $100,000 a year to go to a decent school and unbelievable. We worked in South Africa. I had family medical insurance from the company. Mm -hmm. It was excellent. It was good everywhere in the world because we traveled a lot. Everywhere in the world except America. So here's an international health insurance policy that outlawed treatment in America yeah. because of the price. Hmm. Why? Right now, I don't know why. I'm not going to sit here and tell, well, here's what's going on. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know why either. So on one hand, what it costs to live is irrational, in my view. I yeah. don't understand it. On the other hand, people don't make enough to live anymore, right? No. It, and I watched, I was thinking about yesterday and talking to another guy. Why? You know, on one hand, you've got people like Bernie Sanders saying a minimum $15, $15 minimum wage. California's up at like 16 Now, you look at all that and say, okay, I understand. Yeah. Let's get back to where it is possible to have a one-income family because that's a big deal. But then you bring in 8 million illegal aliens that'll work for food. Yeah. Right. Wait a minute. I, I, you know, because who breathes a sigh of relief? Landscape service industry. Yeah. Fast food, landscapers, pool repair, construction workers. Meat for the, packing, places like that, jobs that Americans don't want. Well, yeah. And now all of a sudden, because there's 8 million people that'll work for food, you don't have to pay more. Hmm. So, who benefits from that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's easy to say, oh, the Democrats are bringing in people to get votes. I think it's not that simple. I don't need I think it's more sinister than that. Yeah. You know, but, they, you know, there's, I read something the other day. They said there's not a, one major American city that a person earning minimum wage working 40 hours a week can afford a studio apartment. No. You know, You're, and like you said, like my, my grandfather worked at a gas station and then I had another job delivering like, you know, propane gas. So, I mean, a very low paying job, but he owned his own house. My grandmother took in laundry, but, you know, she they had a nice house. He had food on the table. Kids went to school. They were fine with that. You know, he, could, he would, couldn't even afford to do anything. He'd be living in your car with that job today. The same job. It, it, well, what was it? When, I bought my first house. We were 22, but it was a little tiny house. I mean, wow. it wasn't. It was. It was a little tiny house. And the, at the median, the, the first time, the average age for a first-time home buyer is, I think, 26, 27. Hmm. Today in America, it's 45, 47. Really? Yeah. And that well, it's what you're talking about. Yeah. You just can't afford. Uh, the median pr house price in Florida is 410 thousand dollars. The media. So you need 80000 bucks basically, just to get the, the loan. Just to get in. And now yeah. you're, I don't know what the house payment is, a couple of grand, three yeah. grand? Yeah, I, very know. few young people have $80,000 sitting around. And that's not a house on the water. No. That's a house inland someplace. Yeah. $410,000. Mm. Why? Mm. You know, California is now 600-something days to get a building permit approved. Mm. You know, so there's some stupid stuff going on. But also, insurance, like where you going to be live in Florida, you know, it's, more you can't even get insurance sometimes. No. If you're in a flood zone, yeah. it, you can't get it at any price. Hmm. And your mortgage requires it. Yeah. So you can't. But that's those are the 1% or 2% houses that are expensive because of the water. Hmm. Like here, you live on the beach, it costs more. Yeah. So, yeah, look, I, I would, I, I think... For me, they're asking the wrong questions. Let's figure out what, why does health care cost what it costs? Why? Why? And, and start working on some of the causes. I don't know what they are. But there's a bunch mm. of smart people. Mm. I, know I, had, I had quadruple bypass surgery. I was fortunate enough to be on Medicaid at the time. But um, if I hadn't been, it would have cost me like half a million dollars. You know? Yeah. Well, and I would have been in debt for the rest of my life, you know? That's one, you know, well, medical care in the Philippines. It's a mixed bag. On one hand, it's a tenth the price of the U.S. Yeah. On the other hand, it's maybe not quite what you're used to. Yeah. 
But there's a whole spread of hospitals here. Like, you know, I've got a baby due any time now. We're going to be at Ace, and it's going to cost me. I'm, I'm guessing if everything goes fine, you know, two to $3,000, which mm. is still a tiny fraction of what it would cost if we were oh, back in America. Exactly. I have no idea what it'd be now, but it'd be a lot. Yeah. Mm. But it, that's a decision people that live here make. I mean, yeah. my intention, you know, we, we have a, well, I'm not particularly happy with the education system, mm. but I'd be ha I'm fine with the girls going to university in Manila. Mm. I'd be okay with that. So I, I'm happy to move back here and put them in school there. Well, how about in Florida, of course, um, <clears throat> what do you think about the schools there? Will they be going to a public school, your daughters, when you move back there? Or? I'm not sure. Not sure? The plan would be, one, re one reason, wherever we live, we'll pick based on the school system. Yeah. But that, because that's the reason, that's my whole focus. I mean, yeah. we built this house to die in, basically. Mm. And now, eh, we, we didn't really plan on the girls, and here we are, so. When did you make this decision about uh, leaving this house and leaving the Philippines and going back to America? I mean, was it something you and your wife just decided overnight, or you've been contemplating this for a couple of years, or? We've been contemplating it for a couple of years since we moved back, since we moved back. Well, what kind of specific things can you tell me that concerns you about the education that they're getting now? Or, or is it just like you said when we were talking off camera about the hours, like how long they have to go to school? And because you said they're gone from like six in the morning till six at night. And yeah, my, my biggest thing is by far, I think kids should be kids. Kids yeah. need the time to be kids. To play, yeah. Right, to, to, to do hobbies and to do stuff and hopefully not scare, stare at a screen someplace, but play yeah. tennis and learn the piano and do all the kids yeah. stuff. And they don't have it. My, we don't live in Dumaguete, we live in Darwin. Mm -hmm. So the girls leave the house at 6.30 in the morning and they get home at six at night. And yesterday they're gonna play after school volleyball, which is, okay, great. Yeah. Now, they won't leave, now they won't get home till seven and 30 or eight. Well, that's 14 hour day. That is. So when do they get to be kids? Do you so, have to drive them to school or they? Yeah, we drive them. Well. I, I don't mind the driving so much as when do they get to be kids? Hmm. So, the, the, and, it, and it's not just Silliman University. That's pretty normal. The, it's, the, it's a very extended school day. Hmm. Well, what about the quality of the education that they're getting? How I'm do you feel about sure. that? I, the math and science are probably okay. They're, not, they're, they're in fourth grade. I mean, honestly, what? it's not that hard. Well, I have people, friends of mine, you know, in their 20s, Filipinos, and some of the questions that they've asked me about different things that you would think, like, you know, someone in middle school in America would know, like, you know, is Australia, you know, part of America, or are mermaids real? I mean, all kinds of things like that. And I wonder, you know, are they most, most kids nowadays, they don't know how to tell time on a regular watch. No. They don't, they don't know how to do that at all. Well, the curriculum, fourth grade, and it changes every year, but the required curriculum is three language classes. That's good. I mean, that, well, it is, but that's a big chunk of your teaching yeah. hours. That could be math and science, and, but it's English, Tagalog, and Visayan. Oh. Well, they have to teach Tagalog here because there's so many different languages in the country and Tagalog's the national language. So fair enough. But, you know, so that's three classes out of, what, six or seven? Yeah, two languages you're never going to lose outside the Philippines. I mean... Uh, look, I'm happy they know it. You know, my wife speaks five. Really? Yeah. So she's... Yeah, and I speak one. So I'm jealous of all the girls. But, look, I'm okay with it, but that's a pretty heavy part of your education, which, you know, reading math and science. Yeah, it is. A lot, you know, especially reading, you know, with the, with the tendency to stare at a screen, I'd be a lot happier if they were doing book reports and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, during COVID, these kids are all, and some of, a lot of these kids around here, they're poor. They didn't have a computer. They were doing coursework for college on their cell phone. Right. For hours a day, you know, and how much can you really learn looking at your cell phone? So yeah, look, I think everybody America took a what they figure lost a year. Yeah, well, yeah, at least. Yeah. Hmm. So we pro I don't think we lost that much because we do have computers. We've got good yeah. internet. Sullivan went online, and it yeah. wasn't terrible. Yeah. 
And in fact, if, if anything, during COVID, they got a chance to be a kid because they knock their schoolwork out in three or four hours and be done. That's good. Um, let's go back to your travels and stuff. So you said um, Mongolia. Mm. And how'd you end up in Mongolia? And tell me what Mongolia is like. I have no idea what it's even like there. Is that where, where Genghis Khan is from, the Mongols? Is yes. That, so um, that's all I know. <laughs> no, we're uh, working in mining and when would that, that would have been 2006. I retired the second time in 2003 and was working, bought a farm. Literally, you say you bought the farm. I bought a farm in Where North at? Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Lamar, nice. North Carolina. How big of a farm was it? 104 acres. Wow. Well, we farmed 18. It was a nursery. We grew trees and landscape material for, wow. for commercial buildings. And my old boss called and said, you know, help a brother out. Can you, can you come do this project in Mongolia, which was a $6.5 billion copper gold mine in the Gobi Desert. Wow. So, yeah. So we ended up in Mon living in Shanghai and commuting to Mongolia two or three times a month. And then because that's where all the engineering procurement was. Mm. And then after that kind of died down, because there's always a natural progression on projects. You finish the engineering and go to the field. Then we moved to Ulaanbaatar, and this is pre-kids and, and a lot, mm. some of it pre-Judith. Mm. So we ended up in Mongolia, which is, it's, it's a different place. Mm. What are the people like there? Are they friendly or? Um, the culture, they're the most individu individualistic set of people in the world which I'll, I'll, I'll say is a compliment. Hmm. The, the thing Genghis Khan did that was impressive isn't so much conquering the known world, it's organizing the Mongolians. Hmm. They yeah. are their own person, they have their own point of view, and that's, what, that's just how it is. It's an interesting hmm. culture. They're not, they're, they're not mean, they're not standoffish, very friendly people, but they're individuals, absolutely. You know, the, well, the summer tradition, which is like not very long, is you go to countryside. They set their tent, their gear up, and live away from everybody with their family for as long as they can. Wow. Nobody tells them what to do. Nobody interferes with them. Everybody's left alone. That's just, the, it's, it's like the western part of America times 10. Wow. Seems like it'd be good for your state of mind, you know, just to clear your mind and be out there in the wilderness and no distractions. And yeah, the, the, the guys that run the country are not afraid to, to, to want money to own a Bentley. The average Mongolian could care less. Half of them are still herders. Hmm. They follow their flocks of sheep and goats and camels around. That's their living. They each hmm. family has three or four pastures and they move. That's their lifestyle. And they don't care about you, I'm going to build a mine and you're going to make, you know, $500 a year. Hmm. I don't need it. So these are the people that if, you know, there's ever some kind of a natural disaster that wipes out humanity, these are the people that probably won't even notice. They'll just keep they'll on going. The, they'll be the last one standing. Yeah. And, and, and half a million plus of them won't even know it happened. Wow. But the south part is the Gobi Desert, which is not the Sahara. It's hmm. gravel. You could drive a Toyota Corolla across the Gobi Desert because it's all fine gravel and rocks. Wow. Because the wind blew all the, <laughs> all the sand away. Hmm. So of all the places that you've uh, lived and worked in, what one really stands out as something really special? You're so glad you got to go there. Pro probably two, Mongolia and South Africa. Hmm. Mongo you know, the South, we lived in the Gobi, which hmm. is it's just different and mm. the north part of the country is stunning mm. it's rivers and green rolling hills and pine trees it's the last that in siberia probably are the last pristine wilderness mm. in the world you've been to siberia i've been at the border of siberia mm. but no i haven't been into russia other than moscow a few times i've never mm. gone into russia i've just been to st petersburg but in south africa is just Gorgeous. Now, did you, while you were there, did you ever cross your mind of maybe relocating there? We, I talked to Judith. About they speak we, English there too, so. Uh, well, we lived in Johannesburg. A lot of people like Cape Town because it's it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we lived in Joburg, and I could easily have retired there. Really? The people are great, the, you know, black and white. The, the people are great. Mm. Uh, the climate is perfect. The winter gets cool, and during the day, the sun comes up and it warms right back up. It's inexpensive there, too, isn't it? like houses and things like that? It, it's a lot cheaper than America. Mm. The, the problem, the only reason, you know, we talked about it, mm. you know, because a friend of mine sold his house and we loved his house. Mm. And, you know, so Ian called and said, you know, I'm moving to England. Yeah. I thought, Matt, come, why don't we retire here? And it's just sort of spiraling down. They've got rolling brownouts and, mm. you know, the, the social situation. It was dangerous when we were there. Mm. I mean, we didn't stay out at night. At, you know, we didn't wander around after dark. We lived behind two sets of security. Yeah, and you don't want to be living in a country like that and you've got two young girls, you know. that's. Yeah. Well, you, you just know, have you to be very... Think of safety first, you know. Yeah, it's not a place you can do whatever you want. Like here, Dumaguete, I wouldn't mind at all wandering through Dumaguete at midnight. No, me neither. You know, go bar hopping, wander no. around. I've never seen any problems at all down there, you no, know what I mean? You wouldn't do that in South Africa. Yeah. You would not do that. You mm. wouldn't do it in a lot of America. That's true. Including Florida. Mm. Especially during spring break. <laughs> yeah, and Darwin's, you know, half a step safer than that. I mean, Darwin's quiet and laid back. and. Yeah, I've been all over the world, too, and... Uh, I've never lived anywhere, been anywhere that I felt safer than I do here in the Philippines. It's just, you know, I, I just don't see the crime. I'm sure there's crime here, but, yeah. you know, I don't see the violent crime and the <coughs> shootings and the things that you see in other countries. And when I go to an ATM machine at, at night, I don't worry about someone robbing me or snatching my cell phone off the table when I'm at a restaurant. Or I just, you know, mm -hmm. I feel content and, and secure here. Well, it, I judge, well, it, do me get it the same way, but Darwin, what I look for is young foreigners wandering around. Mm -hmm. And every year we see more and more of them. They, they'll come in, they'll rent a place for a month or two months or however long. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are working from home now. Yeah. I mean, if you're a young person that's allowed to work from home, why would you have a $3,000 a month apartment in Amsterdam when you can live here? Yeah. So. Well, the internet's changed everything. Like you, know, you and I are the age where you know none of these things ever existed. We didn't even have that option when we were that age. And now, you know, a young person that just a few skills doesn't matter what it is, they can figure out a way to to make a living online with their computer and internet and live anywhere in the world they want. Be digital nomad. That's what I do. You know. Yeah. I you know I make a living you know off my computer. You know, and it gives you total freedom. But it's something so many people you know didn't have the ability to do. You know just going back 30 years. Yeah, we've, we're, we're, we've got a project we're, we're designing now for, for Darwin to put 21 one-bedroom apartments in on the beach. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, even if we sell out and move, we're still committed to the Philippines. I've just got to get the kids in a different school for a while. So you see yourself coming back here someday? Oh, for sure. No, yeah. They, well, you thought about just kind of keeping the house and just... We need, the, we need the money to move. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not rich. It's a big house, but we, I don't have unlimited funds. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'd lo love to be able to write another check for a house in Florida, but nah. <laughs> nah. Do you, um, you going to live near the beach or in town? or? I, I'd like to have a... Because, see, when you go to America, you lose all the help. Yeah, right? that's true. So, yeah. So the maids and the guy doing the yard and the driver and all that stuff just goes away. Because, hmm. I mean, who can afford to pay $15 an hour for a maid? Yeah, true. So, yeah. So that Now, all of a sudden, I've got to take care of the house. I, what we'll probably do is Judith will get a job because she wants to go to work. Hmm. And I'll stay home. I'm 68. I'll stay home with the kids. We're the same age. Okay. Hmm. When's your birthday? July 13th. Okay, I'm November 11. Okay. Wow. Oh. But... Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll be the stay-at-home dad. Suits me. I, I'd like to have a house on a canal with a little boat in the yard and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be a stay-at-home dad because that's something so many other guys that, you know, you went through it yourself having a family when you were younger. And you're so busy with your career and stuff that they grow up like that. It's just you turn around and that little baby's, you know, six years old and you miss so much. And I, it's true with fathers, you know, I think all through America nowadays, they work so many hours. And the benefit 
of the, one of the blessings of being our age and having young children is you're a stay-at-home dad and you get to enjoy all yeah, those absolutely. that childhood you know and hopefully you know remember us and have a you know make an impression on their life you know so it's one of the benefits about being an older father well, I missed my first four daughters growing up yeah, I, me too. I was gone well <clears throat> one income thou yeah. shalt work you yeah. know you do, how much money do we need more yeah you always need more so yeah. yeah I pretty well missed them growing up and now I don't mm. so you know I, I'm talking about going back and doing a, a job for a little bit but it won't be load up and go it'll the, but the whole conversation is not am I willing to help with something it's how, how much time do you need yeah because if the answer is I need full time, I'm not doing it. Well, you can always make more money. You can't make more time, can you? Especially at our age, you know, every day, every day <laughs> yeah. counts. Yeah, you start counting at some point. Yeah. You know? Is that a good use of my time? I think it's almost a good thing when you get to be a certain age, you realize, you know, when you're in your 20s, you think you're immortal. You never think about, mm. you know, the end of your life. When you get older, you realize you've got so many years left, and so you want to make the most out of every day. And uh, I think it gives you a greater appreciation of life. Yeah. Now, have you had any health issues at all? No. Well, you're lucky. Yeah. Well, I, I do. We've got a gym upstairs. I do it a little bit, and don't don't do too much crazy things. They have been lucky. I mean, my dad made it to ninety. My mom was ninety five oh. and still going. Your mother's alive. Wow. Yeah. Not, wow, you got good genes. Yeah. Yeah, you're lucky. And you know, my mother is eighty seven, and she's still alive too, and plays tennis and pickleball and all that okay. stuff. So she's good too. But I had quadruple bypass surgery, and so did my father. Uh, and I was only in my early 60s when I had that. So I've been lucky so far. Hmm. So um, do you have um, health insurance here in the? No. No? We have Phil no. Health, that's it. Sorry? We have Phil Health. I think I've, she may have signed me up for Phil yeah. Health. It doesn't do much. It gets you in the hospital in case mm. of emergency. Yeah, we've, yeah, well, the U.S., you know, Social Security deal, you you know, they won't pay a penny of expenses here. The Medicaid? No, pay. nothing. So I canceled that. They were, you know. Yeah, I canceled my uh, Medicare, Medicare Part B. It was, uh, it's $180 a month I just throw away. And to me, that was a lot of money. Me too. Yeah. And so, I, well, and why am I paying for something I'm not getting? Yeah. I, I still don't understand why that is, but okay, fine. Will you add it back on when you get back to America? Yes, for sure. Yeah. we got to do something. And that's, that's one argument for her going back to work. She's a civil engineer. We met in Shanghai. She was working for an engineering company. Mm -hmm. And what, if she goes back to work, we get benefits. Oh, nice. Which here I'm not worried about. But there, yes, that's yeah. a big thing. Mm. Yeah. So um, what's your time schedule like? You know, this is an incredible house. You're, you're what, 200,000 pesos, you said? 220. 220,000 pesos, which is right around, what, $4 million? Yep, 3.9. Yeah, so um, not a lot of people walking around with $4 million. You think you'll, you'll sell, the buyer will be a, um, a foreigner or a, a local or? I, the people that look at it, and we've had people look at it, mm -hmm. are rich. We've had a couple of rich Filipinos, one time, three years ago, a really famous Filipino sent somebody, which I shouldn't say, hmm. but so far it's been rich Filipinos and it's been uh, Chinese people oh, that want Chinese, to come yeah. in. To, uh, there's, I think there's a bit of money trying to flee China. Oh, I've heard that too. They've we, got no option for investing their money. It's either real estate in China or that's pretty much it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the reality is you can be... Judah sold a, a beach lot. We, d we do real estate. Mm -hmm. She sold a beach lot near Shaton to some Filipino Americans who were coming back here to retire. Mm -hmm. And they built a bamboo and Nipa house that's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a bamboo and Nipa house that's gorgeous. They're beyond happy with it. Mm -hmm. That's a great house, right? So you don't have to spend $4 million to have a nice house. Yeah, It's, it's a function of how do you want to, what can you afford and how do you want to live? So can you be happy in a, Nipa, a one bedroom Nipa house? Of course you can. Hmm. Of course you can. Yeah. Most people are. But you built this house as like your dream house, spend the rest of your life here. And well, and we, you? at the time we had the money, Yeah. right? I was living in the Gobi desert. All the paycheck went in the bank. Um, I had stock options. It wasn't a big deal. Hmm. 
So do you have to buy this house to have a nice house? No. No. Flat out no, you do yeah. not. Can you be happy in a house that costs a million pesos? Of course you can. Mm. Right? So, but if you're Manny Pacquiao that's worth God knows how much, mm. he could buy this house and not think twice. He wouldn't notice it left. Yeah. The money left his account. Yeah. So there's a lot of people, there's more and more people out. There's more millionaires in America. There's like, it's like 10 or 20 a day new. There's so many people that have a lot of money. I just need somebody that says, well, you know, look, even though I could be happy in a Nipa beach house, I don't want to. And, well, and I can do this if I yeah. wanted to. Well, the thing about, you know, this particular property, like if you tried to imagine if you tried to recreate the exactly this house, Let's say in Florida, anywhere in Florida, oh. on the beach, you know, you'd be talking fifty, sixty million dollars, hundred million dollars, maybe. Oh yeah, I mean, the, I've well, seen twenty million dollar houses in Florida. They're on a canal. They're not even on the beach. Oh, in Florida, this is yeah, at least that much. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're eight thousand square meters. We've got a tennis court. We have got a boat ramp. We're the property touches the Basque Norte Marine Reserve. So, hmm. you know, out in front of the house now are all the dive boats from the resort. Yeah, so awesome. we're living at their destination. Yeah. You couldn't pick a better place, you know. Well, I love I, your driveway, by the way. Because <laughs> every place I go, like all the resorts, houses that I've looked at that are on the beach, they've all got this terrible road that's all bumpy and rocks and mud to get to the property. A beautiful piece of property, but it's a rough road, my, my house included, where I live. And you've got this lovely driveway, you know, with well, lights and everything. Well, we <laughs> it's bought. really nice. Well, no, nobody owns the road to the resort. They have right to use it, yeah. but they don't own it. Right. And if the barangay doesn't own it, it won't get paved, it won't mm. get concrete. So yeah, they're kind of stuck. Mm. We, this lot was for sale with one of the banks mm. and it had been on the market a long time because it had no access. Mm. So we bought the beach fairly cheap the driveway costs 600 paces a square meter more than the beach. Wow. Right, because they didn't want to sell. Hmm. And they didn't want to talk to us about access. You know, hmm. we, can we get access to this beach lot if we buy it? Hmm. No. Hmm. What if we sell, sell me a six meter strip? Oh, how much are you offering? 2,400 pesos. The land at the time was worth four or 500. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, doesn't sometimes it happen where this guy, this guy, this guy all agree, and then the last guy says, oh, well, I want 10 times more. Well, we had, that, that lot is still owned by six family members, six pieces of the family that have now grown to mm -hmm. nephews and nieces and everybody. Yeah, closing for that driveway was six family members. Wow. I brought them in from, most of them from Mindanao. Wow. And they all got their cut in cash. But yes, absolutely. All it took was one family member to derail my beach house mm. because we closed on the beach lot the same day as we did the driveway. So we, we basically yeah. had, I'll call it a bank, it was a financial thing. Mm. We had the financing company and the six family member group, everybody wanted their cash and, and basically me. Mm. So yeah. Wow. Yeah, buying land here is an adventure. Yeah, I've heard pluses in my, a lot of my friends now buying land because they're saying that it's a good investment, you know, especially here in Dumaguete, Darwin, this area, Negros Oriental, prices are going up. And uh, I don't know, for me, it's like the, I don't have the skills. Like I was listening to your video with Alex, which I said, again, it'll be a link in the description, but you just seem like a really smart, knowledgeable guy when it comes to construction and building things. Like I wouldn't have a clue. Like you were talking about you raised the house up and drainage and the windows and I wouldn't have a clue on how to do any of that stuff or even I wouldn't know if they were doing it right or they're not doing it. If I was there all day long watching, I wouldn't know if it was right or wrong. And so I really think that these guys that think they can come in and just buy a piece of property and build a house, even if they're going to watch being it built, you really need to have some kind of knowledge. Like I got friends of mine, Greg and Wilma, they built a house up on the mountain here in Darwin. Turned out beautiful, but... Greg was there every single day, like you, and watching, and, and he found things wrong all the time. And he had a good contractor. It wasn't anybody's fault, but I think you really have to have a certain skill level before you jump into building a house here. Well, I wasn't here for this. Now, Judith's a civil engineer. So yeah, she so has, you had her, yeah. Well, she's got the technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
And she's got the management skills too. Well, and we hired a full time team of. I mean, we had, a full time architect lived on the site. Wow. We had an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, um, two others. Civil. Yeah. Structural. I think a structural guy. Electrical. <laughs> so. Then she had the constructing team. She had a technical management team. But they had, see, we're back to the fundamental. Define what you want. Yeah. Right now, if you had in your hand a roll of drawings that said, okay, here's my concrete drawings, mm -hmm. and that column is going to be this big, and it's going to have six pieces of rebar in it, you can do that. I mean, you can go to the job site and count rebar. Yeah, I could do that. Right? So you can look at your drawing, and so it's how, how defined is it? Now, mm -hmm. Judith had 136 drawings. Mm -hmm. Every morning, I got pictures. And the pictures were not to prove she was doing something. The pictures were, how do we do, here's what we're planning to do is, does it work? Mm -hmm. Because even with 136 drawings, there's questions. I mean, good construction guys come in and say, I don't understand this rebar drawing. Mm -hmm. how, how, I see the math, that's easy. You know, all the squares that do that. How does it connect to that, that beam? How does it connect to the wall? I don't see it on here. Well. And she would answer a lot of it, especially the civil stuff. But was, the rest of it was I, I was working with a guy named Ollie Severy, the architect is genius. And, you know, Ollie, how do we do this? And fortunately, our Philippine engineering friends that were working with me in Mongolia, mm. you know, boy Lee Tang, boy Gallus, Fred Bayan. How, what what are we? How do we? What did we intend with this? Because I didn't know every detail either. Mm -hmm. What you know? You know, boy, you he did some structural things that are brilliant. How how did you see this happen? He'd fix it. Well, didn't you have to also factor in the fact that you know there are typhoons here, there could be a tsunami here, there are earthquakes on a regular basis. You know, not big ones, but, but, but it's we do get them. Designed for that. What? It's designed for that. As, as I was saying, you had to factor you had to factor all that in. Well, and, and would, would, would you, let's say you were building this house in Colorado and you're building it here in the Philippines, there were things that you had to have structurally that you wouldn't normally, because you're on the ocean, because of the, of the weather and everything. Well, and depending on where in, Co in Colorado, right, if you're, we did, as you would on any project, this isn't unique to the house, you do soil tests. Hmm. You, you need to drill down and take a sample of, you know. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, you, What's under your house, right? Is it yeah. a hole? Is it a sinkhole like Florida? Is yeah. it a big cavern of limestone? Is it sand, gravel, rock? What's under your house? Because all those answers give you a different foundation. What's under this house? Sand. Hmm. Um, how many meters? Like five or six meters. So what that did is dictated a different foundation than if it had been rock. Hmm. If it had been rock, we'd had a much smaller foundation. Hmm. And so this is what I call column and beam, which is picture a bird cage, yeah. right? It's a big bird cage made out of concrete and steel. And with the difference being because it's, a, it's like a big box bird cage, you got to tie it together for flexing. Mm -hmm. So you end up with cross beams and cross stuff. So you build a big concrete frame. Then you tie all the pieces together. And that's what a structural engineer does. Hmm. Well, so um, say you sell the house tomorrow and you have to go through here and what are you gonna take with you and what are you not gonna take with you? And then how do you get it back to Florida? We I get the guys, we pack everything in a box. What, what, and that's, but that's part of the decision point. Do I need a, con, a, a nine foot long German concert grand piano in a normal Florida house? No. Mm -hmm. Where do you put the damn thing? Yeah. Do I need a nine foot long pool table in a, a small three bedroom, three bath house in Florida? No. So we, we started going through it and said, well, this is silly. Why are we trying to furnish a house we mm -hmm. don't own? We haven't even picked it out. Well, do you need a water buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could, that's negotiable. There he is, there. 
<laughs> there, aren't many, there aren't many rooms they'll fit in, especially the kudu. The horns are just so tall. Yeah. But, yeah, so we decided we'll just sell it furnished. Then all we have to move is the art and personal stuff. So it won't be mm. a big move. Mm. Wow. But the boat's got to go. The cars have to go. The Polaris has to go. We have to get rid of everything, which is fun. What do you... I guess you got to wait till you sell the house before you do all that. But what? Let, let me ask you this: What happens if the house doesn't sell? We'll stay. Oh, you'll stay here, okay? Well, we don't have a lot of choice. I don't yeah. have enough money to just pick up an entire family, and it, you know, it's. I wish I did. If I was Bill yeah. Gates, I'd have been gone two years ago. But yeah. nah, not so much. And so, if you got to get a call about a job in some really cool place and really good money. And they'll take the whole family, that's out of the question now, you just won't do that anymore? Or I don't just, think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. Hmm. It depends on where. You know, would we go back to South Africa for a couple of years? Yeah. I really liked it. Would we go to the States for a couple of years? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, get, I hadn't even thought about that. Hmm. I'm 68. Nobody wants to hire a, a you know, 68-year-old mining guy full-time. No. But, you know, help me out with something part-time. Okay. Hmm. So, um, why Florida? I mean, uh, there's so many places in America, you know, is it something about you like living there? Because, you know, there's a lot of problems with Florida with the weather and the, um, the insur homeowner's insurance now and all the other things going on. There's so many other places in America, like, you know, out the West, like, you know, Montana, Colorado, all those. Like Utah, I lived in Utah. It was beautiful there. Good school systems, low crime. I mean, why Florida? My wife's not a huge fan of snow, and after seven winters in Mongolia, neither am I. No. So, yeah, if we're Florida, is, it's the the weather's mostly like the Philippines. This is true, yeah. Right, and the water's good. I want the kids to learn about boats. Um, we've got a boat, and it's a little bit too big for them. Mm. So I like them to. But anyway, I like the kids. To, I grew up on the water. I like the yeah. kids to grow up. They don't need much to do that. No. Yeah, that's true. Well, um, going here about 46 minutes, much longer than I normally go. I, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate I've it. it. I really do. And um, once again, guys, I'm going to put a link to Alex's video. If you want to see this incredible house, Alex did an amazing video, and you can see the whole house and everything. So make sure you check that out in the description below. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I really appreciate it. Bye.